welcome everyone to the very first episode of the SBE podcast, the place where we share interesting stories of interesting people. My name is Louis Morgner and today I'm joined by Professor Dr. Paul Smeets, who is a professor in philanthropy and sustainable finance, also the co-founder of the Sustainable Finance Master Program and investigates the question of how to best spend charitable money. Did I get this right, Paul? Yeah, you got it right, except for the fact that you are saying that we, did you get interesting people. I guess they are coming in the next episodes. <laughs> I'm not too sure about that. I think we have a really good start here in this first episode and we will see how this goes. So my first question for you, Paul, is actually um, take me back a little bit into the early days of your career. Like what got you into uh, finance actually in the first place and how was your path? Yeah, that's very funny. So as, 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 as a kid, uh, I always wanted to be a garbage collector. And and I always was also uh, joining the guys on the big truck, you know, to collect the garbage. And then one of the guys said to me, no, no, Paul, you shouldn't become a garbage collector. So then my second passion that I discovered uh, uh, next to garbage collecting in high school was uh, was economics. Okay. I was actually one of the very few uh, uh, kids in the, in the classroom who liked economics. Everybody hated it. And uh, I thought, well, you know, if, if I like this and all the rest doesn't, maybe that's the career for me. So uh, I think already quite early on then in high school, I discovered that I, that I wanted to become an economist. Uh, but I had no idea that I wanted to become a researcher. Uh, I, I think a lot of times, you know, students also, they are struggling with what should I do later on, you know. And they are stressed if they don't immediately know. Well, I definitely didn't know. And I'm writing now, or reading now this book. It's called uh, Range by David Epstein. It's about the power of being a generalist. And one of the recommendations that he makes is you should just try out a lot of things at the beginning of your mm -hmm. career. You just try a lot, you know. And by that you discover two things. You discover what you like and you also discover what you're good at. And I think what, what, what I discovered was when I was writing my master thesis that, uh, that that was something, A, that I really enjoyed doing uh, and also something that I thought, oh, I, I, I have quite some talent for doing this. And for a lot of other things, I have less talent. But this was one that I thought, yeah, this fits me. And uh, but then when a PhD was offered to me, I thought, you know, I just try it. Uh, but again, with the idea, I'm not sure whether this is it for me. Uh, so I also didn't have the stress during the PhD of, oh, you know, I need to become a professor because I thought if I fail or I don't like it, I'm going to do something else. But here I am. I'm still, I'm still around as a professor now. Yeah, and we're happy that you're here today uh, telling us a little bit about your experience. Where did you actually grow up? Was it close to Maastricht? Or? I, I grew up in Landgraaf. As maybe some people know from Snow World, like yeah. the Pink Pop Festival. Mm -hmm. We had a, a Bruce Springsteen, the Rolling Stones, Justin Bieber, all in my back garden. I mean, it's, it's a small town of 40,000, and then you manage to see Bruce Springsteen. Just You can walk towards Bruce Springsteen. I mean, that's just incredible. Uh, and uh, so I've spent my entire career in, in Maastricht, at Maastricht University, but I have been... Uh, also, a lot of times in the U.S., so I spent uh, a lot of uh, semesters working at the University of California, Los Angeles, in San Diego. Uh, so, uh, yeah, and I, I really enjoyed that, to be in different places, learn from different people. Well, um, really interesting. What I've seen on your website, you always say that a hobby of yours is keyboard playing. So is there like a passion uh, of music for you? Oh, absolutely, yeah. So, so I started playing when I was seven years old. Actually, this weekend I get a piano because now with the COVID lockdown, you know, a lot of hobbies you can't do anymore. So I thought, okay, I, I want to do some active leisure. Mm -hmm. Maybe we will talk about that later because it's very good for your happiness. And I therefore decided I'm going to get a piano. Uh, so I, I will have one this weekend. Well, uh, then good luck uh, starting out uh, with your new piano. Um, sounds really interesting. So you told me you're, you've been to many different universities and places and a lot of um, also prospective students um, are in the kind of position where they need to decide where to go and to what university. My question would be, what makes Maastricht University and especially SBE special for you? Yeah, 
I, I think there are a couple of things that I that I really like at, at, at our faculty. So uh, I, I think for one, I mean, I also studied here. And, and, and I just see, when, when you look at the skills that you need in the labor market, you know, it's not about whether you get your microeconomics formula exactly correctly or whether you know the perfect way of doing the accounting. You know, you have to learn that too. But you can learn those things also on the job to a large extent. But what you really need are what we call non-cognitive skills. So it's not your IQ, but it's, for example, presentation skills, uh, social skills. Uh, it's about how, how do you tackle a, a, a problem in an efficient manner. And I th think what, what distinguishes Maastricht and, and, and SBE from other universities is our problem-based learning system in which you just get much more experience in, in really being active in a group, presenting. And I think that are, that are skills that you also see in the labor market that, that people value a lot. And next to that, the, the, the school has a very clear focus on, on sustainability. And uh, that, that, that's just something that when I, when I was studying, that was not yet the case. And so our business school, but also other business schools, we're not doing anything with sustainability. I mean, I was still grown up with the idea that people are selfish. You know, that's a typical economic way of looking at people and everybody just wants to maximize money. But now we learned that that is not true. And, and, and our faculty, I think, is also a front runner. That's what you see. We were we, in the Financial Times list of most sustainable universities. We score really high. Uh, and, and I just think that prepare students uh, for, for a very versatile career because sustainability is just a topic that will not disappear. That's uh, definitely true. Also talking about impact, maybe the Elizabeth Struven Foundation is closely linked to your professor's chair here at uh, Maastricht. Can you tell us a little bit about the foundation and what it does? Yeah, that's right. So um, uh, my professor chair in philanthropy and sustainable finance is also partly financed by the Elizabeth Sloven Foundation. The Elizabeth Sloven Foundation goes back about 200 years already uh, in history. So at that time, we had uh, uh, not yet all the government support. Uh, that's now, again, a very relevant topic with the corona. Um, and at that time, that wasn't the case. So if you were poor, uh, then uh, you, you needed to get money uh, from another way because you didn't get it from the government. And that was the, uh, at that time we had a poverty bank, so to say. So if you were poor, you could go there and you could get some support. And the church has always also had that role, but uh, Elizabeth Struven as well. And then at some point, the, um, well, the, the, the government took over the, the poverty help. And uh, then the, this, this money was still there. And, of course, the Elizabeth Stoven uh, uh, Foundation did not just want that money to go into the government pocket because then it just disappears with all the other expenses. So they uh, put it into an um, endowment fund. So this money is now being invested. It's, it's about 140 million euros. And, uh, and out of the return that they make, uh, they, they spent this on social, cultural and environmental projects in Maastricht and surroundings. Oh, that's a great initiative. Um, also, this is, I think, a great transition towards uh, one of your subjects of expertise, being sustainable finance um, on philanthropy in general. My question would be, why do people give to charity? I think that's something research, and I would love to hear your opinion on that. Yeah, and that also goes back to this idea that people are not the homo economicus who's just self-interested. We are social creatures. I mean, the whole... You, you, you see it now more than ever before that... that we are not made for being locked up in our rooms following tutorials via Zoom. That's, I mean, it has to be, but it's not how, how people function. People are social creatures and, and we want to uh, naturally help other people. Right? And I think that's, that's something that is so ingrained in our being that, uh, that, that people just want to want to give back to society. And particularly, of course, if you're a student, you don't have so much money. So maybe you give small amounts or you give time, you can volunteer. And then as people uh, have a good career, they earn more, they, they donate larger sums of money. Mm -hmm. One uh, subject you also focus on is uh, especially on millionaires and why millionaires give to charity. Um, can you maybe jump on this? Yeah, definitely. So uh, I, I did a couple of times uh, studies together with ABN Amro Bank, uh, where we looked at the, 
their millionaire clients. So they have a private bank, Mace Pearson. And, uh, and, and I wanted to know, so what makes millionaires give to charity? And uh, well, what, what is very interesting is that millionaires, uh, they, they, they give if you really ask them to give, but not if you start bargaining. So, uh, and, and very often what you see is that, that it's going wrong. So uh, the way we, we did that in, in our study is we had two groups of millionaires, so one group of millionaires, we just asked them, here you have 100 euros, and I gave them real money. So you must imagine you sit now at home and you get from me 100 euros. And then I say, okay, you can divide up this amount between yourself and another low-income individual in the Netherlands. Then we have a second group of millionaires. They do the same thing, but now you can have the 100 euros, but you decide how to split it with the low-income individual who can accept or reject the amount. So now it's a bargaining situation. Mm -hmm. And what we observe is that if we just ask the millionaire how much of the 100 euro do you want to give, then half of the millionaires give the full 100 euros away. Now we switch to the bargaining. The most millionaires divide the money 50-50 because they think it's a business deal. And in a business deal, you share the pie. And I think this is super important because very often this goes wrong, you know, when you give to charities, they give you all kind of presents. Like, oh, here you get coffee for free, you get a, a T-shirt, you get this or that. Puts people in the business mindset. They think, oh, but at the other charity, I got a free museum night. That's much nicer, right? So, and I think we need to get away from this business mindset and really tap to, into the giving mindset. I think that's a really interesting topic you touch upon. Um, as I imagine the world right now, there are organizations who do charitable things for our society, and there are those individuals who have philanthropic views uh, to the world and uh, want to engage in those kind of activities. Um, how does the like matchmaking process look like at the moment? Um, like, how do those individuals or millionaires find the right projects and organizations to invest in? Yeah, that's a, that's a very uh, difficult one. Uh, now, now that goes usually via their personal network. Um, but what, what now uh, my, my colleagues and I are doing is actually setting up a, uh, an online giving platform, which we, which we call sort of the Tinder of charitable giving. Uh, so where it will be really easy for you to, to swipe charities you know, and, and projects uh, and, and we want to make uh, uh, charitable giving as, as, as fun or as frustrating as dating. It depends how, how you look at it. <laughs> um, but but what, what, what you really see is that now also if you, let's say you have a great initiative, you, maybe you want to take this podcast to a national level and you need funding for that. Well, where do you go? Now, what we want to do with the platform is, is to give you a very easy way to do that because you, you submit your proposal to our platform in a standardized way. Uh, maybe we give you the option to create a short video or a sample. You know, it's all on the side. And then the foundations and also individuals can directly start funding the projects in a much more efficient and, and fun way than that is currently happening. Can this actually be compared to crowdsourcing? I mean, there are platforms out there like Kickstarter where new business products are being started. Yeah, that's right. And, and, and it, it has definitely similarities to that, but it's a big difference because our platform is, is, is not made for business ideas. So it will not be that you can invest in to, to, to make money. It's really a charitable giving platform. So you can give money, You could provide a loan for 0% interest. You can give time so you can volunteer. And, 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 and in a way, we want to sort of create that kickstart environment, but then for charitable giving. And what is very nice is that um, we, we are doing now the business plan together with two uh, students that were also in uh, uh, my sustainable finance class. Uh, they, they won the case competition in the class wow. and now we, we, we hired them to develop the business case and now we're trying to get foundations on board to become investors into our social enterprise and that we can then really make it a full-fledged uh, social uh, company. 
Wow, that's great. Where can people find more uh, about this project? Yeah, so uh, th there was an article already in the SBE note, but we will uh, update that frequently. Uh, so there is a we are we are planning to do the funding round with the foundation at the end of this year, and then hopefully in the second quarter of twenty one, uh, we can go live with this uh, product. Really cool. Uh, congratulations uh, for that, definitely, and good luck uh, for the next steps ahead. Uh, maybe also, again, taking a step back and talking about the bigger perspective sure. of things, what are some trends you're seeing in the space of philanthropy um, in the world right now? So one, one big trend is that you now see a transition from giving to investing. And that is often then in the form of impact investing. So you, you see that the, the amount of money that is being donated is, is, is going down. Uh, and the amount of money that is being invested with a social or environmental purpose is going up. So this, this difference between the, the, the finance world and the philanthropy world, which before were like huge, right? I mean, nobody who would study finance and learned about the capital asset pricing model, you know, which you all learn in your first year finance class, would think to, that that has anything to do with charitable giving. And now you see that these two worlds just really become much more close to each other. And I think that's nice. It also gives it a bit of a dynamic. And, and we definitely, I think, could profit from, from having a charity also run much more like a business. You know, because in a business, in a company, you have clear targets and you, and you want to reach those targets. And till now, I mean, there was a lot of good intentions among charities, but very often the business mindset wasn't really there. There was not a focus on how can we spend this euro in such a way that we get the most benefits for society as possible, right? And, and, uh, and I think we can really do much more there and also using scientific insights Uh, for example, last year the Nobel Prize in economics uh, went to, to to three development economists, and, uh, and 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 then what you see is they did a lot of studies to 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 figure out how can we uh, reduce poverty in the most effective way, how can we improve healthcare, uh, and and still a lot of those insights are not being put into practice, and it's a shame mm -hmm. because the evidence is already out there. So when you regard charity or philanthropy uh, more from business mindset, I imagine performance measurement is also a topic that uh, one needs to consider. How do you measure impact or the performance of uh, a charitable organization nowadays? Right. So I think there you have to distinguish between the performance of the charity and the performance of a single project. So uh, and and. What, what I'm mostly doing at the moment is to evaluate specific projects, as also what these Nobel Prize winners did. Uh, so, for example, um, I'm doing with the Elisabeth Stroven Foundation a project together with the Musikgitarre, that is a pop stage uh, here in Maastricht. Mm -hmm. maybe, maybe you've been, nice bands come there. Mm -hmm. uh, at the moment, of course, not, but we hope very soon again. And they, they set up a music education program for children. So these children, they, they make a pop band together. So one child learns to play the guitar, and the drums, we have a singer. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and then they perform together. And they, they can perform on the stage of the music guitar. And uh, what we are now going to investigate is whether with such music education, we can improve the non-cognitive skills of these children. And so the non-cognitive skills, remember, is also uh, these things like persistent social skills, you know, that we know are very important on the labor market. And because these children, they, they have to play together in the event, they cannot do it on their own, they also will fail at some point, so they need to be persistent, we hope that we can uh, actually find those positive effects so we will follow those children over time. And what we will do is we will compare schools who participate in the program to schools who do not. So schools can have, show an interest to us, and then we randomly assign, okay, this school goes into the program, and this school goes into the control group. And that allows us to study, well, do we really see that in those schools where we have the music education program, the children have better non-cognitive skills than in the schools where they do not. 
Well, that's really interesting. When can we kind of see the first results or are there already tendencies? So at the moment, we are uh, setting up the pilot, which we are going to do with one of the schools. And then in, uh, in, in February, we will start with, uh, with, the, with the bigger amount of schools. And, and then uh, hopefully at the end of next year, so end of 21, we have the, the first results coming in. Great. That's uh, awesome. Another topic that's also probably linked to the development of non-cognitive skills is uh, happiness to some extent, I'd imagine. Another big topic where you're doing research is uh, what, people, what makes people actually happy and more specifically what millionaires do differently to buy happiness, which sounds kind of controversial. Um, yeah. Yeah, yeah, maybe can you jump into this topic? Yeah, by the way, we also measure the happiness of these children. Mm -hmm. So we will also see whether music education generally makes you happier. Yeah. There is all kind of evidence from brain research suggesting that is the case. Well, we will see. Um, but what we did with the, with the millionaires is uh, I actually asked a, a whole group of 800 Dutch millionaires like how they spent their day. And I asked the same to 1,200 people from the Dutch general population. And I also asked them to rate their happiness on a scale from 1 to 10. That's just like you get a grade in, at Maastricht University for your QM course. You also can grade your own happiness. And um, what, what we then uh, uh, see is, uh, well, a couple of things. So first of all, we see that in many uh, aspects, a millionaire spends the time exactly in the same way as we do. So millionaires spend the same amount of time eating, cooking, doing uh, uh, all kind of regular activities that we do too. That was for me quite surprising because I thought that they were much more different. But there is one aspect in which the, the millionaires differ and that is in, in how they spend their leisure time. So working millionaires actually have less leisure time than the general population. They work more hours but they spend their leisure time in a much more active way. So millionaires are more likely to exercise, to socialize with hobbies, and the, the general population spends much more time watching TV. And uh, watching TV or any other screen devices, you know, it's the, the number one uh, reason for misery in our data set. So from all the activities, when we relate them to happiness, the, the strongest negative relation is between screens and happiness. And there was also recently, there was a very interesting study that came out about uh, social media. So they actually paid a group of people uh, an amount, I think it was something like $90, to switch off their Facebook account for a month. So they said, okay, if you switch off your Facebook account, we pay you $90. And then they compared that to another group where they did not do it the similar way as we do it with the schools. And, and what you see is that uh, uh, even several months later, those people who switched off their Facebook are still substantially happier than the people who, who still have the Facebook. And also the people who experienced to be off Facebook for a month are now likely to say, okay, I'm not going to reactivate it either. So I think we just overspend time on, on screens and, and, and much rather than doing that. And of course, uh, uh, that is something that everybody can do because uh, going out for a walk, me, uh, being around with, with friends, even though that is now, you cannot have huge groups of people, but you can, you can still uh, have a small group of people around you. And that, that's just... Uh, very good for your happiness. Were you able to identify a reason why millionaires are so aware of those um, happiness-inducing activities compared to the average person? So like something you could trace this back to? We can't, and that would be something that is very interesting to, to, to study that in the future because you, you essentially would need to go back in time or how these millionaires were. But, but what I do see more generally is that these millionaires also, for example, once they retire, on average, they keep working for still around 10 hours per week. And uh, so there, I think there is something fundamentally, but that is speculation because I cannot ultimately mm -hmm. test that, but uh, there is something in the personality that um, makes these millionaires m more active. You know, they just want to be busy with things o other than, than watching television. Um, one thing that I would personally be interested in is kind of 
what um, habits do you specifically see also young people uh, doing or picking up that might imply a bigger extent of happiness in the future? Is there something I know that's maybe not uh, empirically proven, but some tendency you appear with your work, um, with the millionaires and average people? Uh, Yeah, so uh, I, I think there are a co couple of things also there. So one of the things that we, for example, uh, find in another article, which is called Buying Time Promotes Happiness, mm -hmm. is, is that um, a lot of people tend to prioritize uh, money over time, right? So we, we go to great lengths to spend a lot of time to make more money. And... Uh, And, and what we actually see across the board, and, and, and my, my co-author Ashley Willens also showed that now in 27 countries, is that uh, people who prioritize time over money are substantially happier than the other way around. Mm -hmm. And what we did specifically in our study is we, is we, we asked people, do you outsource any type of, of tasks that you dislike So some people, they dislike cleaning their house, others don't like gardening, and another person really hates to, to, uh, to fix the IKEA furniture. Now you can outsource those activities. And we see that across the board, people who outsource those activities they dislike are significantly happier in the United States, in Canada, in Denmark, in the Netherlands, all across the board. And while that is the case, a lot of people, they keep doing everything themselves. And, and I think we can really learn from that, that, uh, that, that time is one of our very scarce resources. And also, everybody has the same. And no matter whether you're a millionaire or not, we all have 24 hours in a day. And it's up to us how we want to spend that time. Yeah, I think there's a lot of truth to this, um, especially when you think about it's all about how you allocate your time. And uh, as I get kind of the uh, or kind of the conclusion of what you said is uh, that millionaires are better at allocating their time to increase their happiness than the average person. Uh, in in general, they are better. Even though also with the millionaires, we see that about a half of them don't outsource any tasks. So they have a huge house, and and they clean it themselves, right? Uh, so they spend even more time cleaning. And 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 when I then talk to the millionaires, because of course then sometimes I present to the millionaires and I sit with them at the lunch table. And then ask, so why is that? And then there are all kind of really weird reasons. So, in, for, so for, for example, in, in the Netherlands uh, particularly, we are very Calvinistic, you know. We have this, this tr tradition that we should not spend too much money. You know? And if you can clean the house by yourself, you should do it by yourself. But if you apply the same logic, we could also grow our own cucumbers, right? That's also <laughs> cheaper than going to the Albert Heijn. But that we don't do. So there is a very inconsistency that is around uh, how we spend our time. And, and we don't make a, a, a rational, a rational trade-off there. And I think another uh, thing that applies to both students and to, to, to also working individuals is we fill our agenda with a lot of meetings. And, and, and I, I think I, I read that yesterday, we spend on average in a work week 24 hours in meetings. Oh. That's just huge. So that is more than half of your working week. And, 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 and we don't assess whether all of those meetings are really that necessary. We don't assess because the standard time of a meeting all across the world is an hour. It's just standard. If somebody plans a meeting, the meeting takes an hour. And, and people are very good in filling that hour, right? If you have an hour, you fill an hour. If you have one and a half hours, you fill one and a half hours. And uh, so one of, one of the, 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 the tips that I, that I got from, from a colleague was ma make the meeting standard 30 minutes. And then what you discover is that a lot of things you can actually also discuss in half an hour. And, that, and if you do that with all your meetings, that, that, that shrinks your meetings from 24 to 12 hours per week, hey, now you have more time. Well, maybe implying from that, now that we spend so much time in front of our screens with the Zoom meetings, shouldn't we all be miserable uh, due to COVID? So what is interesting about uh, Zoom is, uh, and in general about uh, the social, uh, uh, well, well, this video, uh, social media, whatever it is, is that we um, usually, so now I, I look at you and I can see your body language. Mm -hmm. 
And that gives me 90% of the information. Again, from, from all the information that we process, what we actually say is 10% of how the other person receives the message. 90% comes from body language. And that is made of, of, of your intonation, but also how you sit, how you act. You know, that gives a lot of information. Now, the problem is, when we look at the screen, we have the video, but there are two things. Number one, we miss the body language because we only see the face. And number two, there is actually a short delay. And our brain, therefore, needs to work extremely hard to try to interpret the body language. And that's why we are so tired at the end of the day. Well, that's uh, interesting. I think uh, something a lot of students also experience. Um, interesting to see that you also have the scientific look at uh, why this is actually the case. One thing I'm personally really interested in is minimalism and uh, the whole movement around essentialism. So looking at what is essential and focusing on that in your life. Does this also connect to the findings you have? Oh, absolutely. There's, by the way, a great book. It's, it's called uh, Essentialism by Greg McEwen. I can really recommend that one. And that, that, that tells you, you should go down to the, to the things that really matter and then spend a lot of time on those things that really matter. Right? And, uh, and, and we don't do that generally. Like I, I'm, I'm worried about a lot of things. And then in the end, you think, well, I've been worrying the whole day about some kind of stupid uh, detail. Right? And, 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 and I, I think to some extent, that is what it is. You know, we, we are we also not robots, but we can really try to, to be a bit more essential. And, and what is also um, definitely related to these findings on, on time versus money. Uh, is that was another finding of our work, is that spending money on buying more stuff, that generally doesn't really make you much happier. And, and, I, and I always apply a very simple rule to my own purchases. So, for example, now I, I bought a piano, and then I ask myself the following question, how will this purchase change my time use? And how I will change my time. This is probably every day I will play for about half an hour on the piano. So every day I will enjoy this piano. But to give you another example of where people buy something and it does not change their time use, is people who, uh, when we go to the millionaires, have a swimming pool. So when you, when you buy a swimming pool, you see yourself at the swimming pool with friends and drinking cocktails and you, oh, you have to think, oh, this is great. But then in the reality of things, you are stressed, you come home, and you, you rarely use the swimming pool. So that's what you see across the board. When people have a swimming pool, they rarely use it. But you need to have a pool person, you need to clean it, and so a lot of costs. And I think that's, that's in the end, the, the, the key, if you, if you buy something, always ask yourself, how will this purchase change my time? Yeah, that's great. So don't buy a swimming pool if you want to be happy. <laughs> don't, don't buy a swimming pool. Rather have a cleaning person, for example, or of a course. gardener and yeah. buy time. Yeah. yeah. What is actually the biggest mistake you see people make when pursuing happiness? Oh, so uh, I, I think, you know, what, when, when, and this relates a lot, I think, to students also. So when, when you start working... Uh, and 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 you, I mean, I, I'm in the finance department, so I see it a lot in in banks and consulting companies. So what what happens? But it's also the case in in science, by the way. So you're you're very easily being caught up in a system of performing, prestige. And if in the university world, you see that you know now I climbed up to be professor. Uh, you, you need to publish, you know, you, you can be at prestigious conferences. There's a lot of ego-boosting activities. And, uh, and, and I think what is very dangerous is if you go into that path and you are in a consulting company and now you, now you become the senior consultant. So now if you work 80 hours per week, but then they say, okay, but, but you know, if you now keep working for another five years, 100 hours, then you become a partner. I know you do that, but now you are a partner, you earn two million per year. Yeah, now you really don't want to give it up. And what then ends up is in the end, you have a lot of money, but you have never made a conscious decision 
and, and so it's not wrong. Maybe, maybe that's in the end what you want. But I think what is very good is to ask yourself once in a while, am I still on track with what are my key goals? So that is this book Essentialism that asks you, what are your true values? And maybe your true values are also spending time with your friends, spending time with your family. And now you have to sacrifice it for your career. Now maybe it's worth it. And maybe it's not. And I think we just need to make a conscious decision. And what I do very regularly with, with for example, my, my friends around me, once, once a year I ask them, do you think I'm still on track in terms of my values? Am I doing a good job? Or would you say that I spend too much on one aspect of my life or another? And then I tell them, please give me harsh feedback. And I think it's just good to, to keep keep pushing yourself, are you still doing those things that are truly in line with your personal values? Yeah, so basically get yourself an accountability buddy for happiness. Absolutely, yes. Yeah, that's great. Maybe to sum things up um, in the end, because uh, we are having a look at the time, um, and I think that's the last question for today, would be, what is one wish you would have for the world in regards to philanthropy or happiness in general? So what's your wish for the world? then I think it's, it's one very clear thing. At this moment, uh, it, it's, it's, a, it's a very sad statistic. So for 20 years, we had world poverty declining rapidly. It halved. Po world poverty halved. And when we talk about world poverty, we are talking about people that live on less than $2 per day. We had 800 million people a few years ago. Now, with the COVID-19 is the first time again since these 20 years that world poverty is going up. And that's really sad because we were on a very good trajectory of reducing global poverty and now it's increasing. And I would say the, my key focus in terms of also this effective giving research is to reduce that extreme poverty, which is particularly the case in developing countries. Well, I think that's a great uh, ending word, actually. So, um, in the end, Paul, thank you very much for taking the time today to be the first guest on this very first episode of the SBE podcast. To the viewers and hopefully listeners, we're excited to welcome you again for a future episode and we highly encourage feedback in any area. If there's something you want to let us know, just reach out. And in general, we hope that you have a great day and thank you for your time today. Thanks for having me. Perfect. I think it's a good end, right? Yeah. <laughs> awesome.